Hello, welcome to a very special uh, Coding Rainbow episode. Um, I'm trying a new experiment, which I hope to do many more of, which is have guests here in the studio. So I'm super excited to introduce these two guests today, uh, Claire Kearney Volpe and Chansey Fleet. They're working on a really, ex they're working on a lot of different things, but uh, namely uh, a lot of projects and research around accessibility and code. Um, and this, a lot of, of the work that they're doing is in collaboration with the Processing Foundation on the various tools that Processing works on, specifically P5.js, which is going to have a new release of a web editor sometime soon, which I'm sure I'll hopefully talk about and show at some point. Um, and uh, that editor and how that editor can be made accessible and available to blind and visually impaired people. So one thing I want to briefly mention before I get started um, asking some questions is that there, if you want to watch this video using Udescribe, which is a tool that um, allows you to um, hear descriptions of some of the images and things that we'll be showing, um, there'll be a link in this video's description for you to go ahead and do that, okay? Uh, I guess my first question for you guys is just how did you meet and how did you get started doing this work? Well, um, I was doing my thesis work when Chansey and I met, and we were working on a project together to make a diagramming tool mm -hmm. uh, that would be accessible. And Chansey, you had like the idea for the project. You want to say what your sure. purpose for it was? So I'm so glad we were connected. I think we were collect connected by a colleague of mine from the, uh, the CUNY Disability Studies program, of which I'm a graduate. And Claire was looking to collaborate with users on participatory design projects that were driven by the user's individual goals, which is a really important thing. Rather than imagining what a user with a disability might want, participatory design asks, um, which is fabulous. And one of my abiding wishes over the years has been to have a tool for dealing with spatial content and spatial relationships. And the example that I came to Claire with was that every year I've got to help plan this massive technology and culture fair at the place where I work and it's we've got 30 plus exhibitors each year and some of them need a certain type of space and some of them need outlets and some of them should be or shouldn't be next to other ones it's a lot like a like a law school admission like a logic game problem um, and it's really at least for me viciously difficult to do in linear or textual format. And so I wanted to do the thing that most of you take for granted, which is to drag and drop the happy little tables until I found an optimal arrangement. And there's no real software solution that works well with screen readers. And I'll talk more about screen readers in a minute. Mm -hmm. And so I came to Claire and said, please help. This is the thing that I am missing um, in my workflow that would really have an impact. And a couple things from that project <laughs> was, first of all, I was like not very good at coding in general, and even worse at coding uh, excessively, meaning people that use screen readers could have access to the information and use the application that right. I was making. Um, and I was like looking online for resources and just was met with like really dense, wordy things that weren't really approachable to like a code beginner like myself. And so that was like the first issue that we kind of, we butted up against. And then another thing was if this project was going to be truly participatory, Chansey was going to have to like roll up her sleeves and start coding. But when we looked online, well, the majority of the, the, uh, the resources online for learning how to code were not accessible or just like not super user friendly. So coding was completely new for you or had you dabbled or done certain things with it before? I mean, so here's the thing. There have been, for decades, there have been some blind folks that learn to code and that make livings coding. And so I'm not going to say that there's nothing out there, but we're in this moment where, in the broader sense of the term, coding education is being made as accessible as possible. So to different diverse communities, to people that might have never considered it before, to people that might not want to do it full time every day, but who might need to incorporate it into their studies or their careers. And that's where I am. I'm probably never going to be a full time coder. That's not my aspiration. There was nothing at the kind of friendly novice level that I could find. Um, an hour of code here and there that happened to be accessible, um, sometimes a video that was verbalized enough to be usable, but 
I came out across just a ton of websites where either the information was pretty advanced and pretty dense, or if it wasn't, it was heavily picture-driven, relied on videos that didn't mm -hmm. have um, description of screenshots, um, and sometimes incorporated learning tools like text editors in the browser that were simply not accessible to a screen reader. So I came up across uh, a ton of roadblocks, and so I stopped with just a little bit of HTML under my belt and didn't really revisit the question until I met Claire. Right, and you know, I think it's really interesting that you talk about coding just as a skill or a thing that you might do in combination with what you're already doing in your work or a hobby. And I think this is, you know, at coming from the sort of processing foundation and working with tools like processing in P5JS, a lot of the way people learn to program is not to become a computer scientist or to focus their entire life on code, but to add that as a as a tool in, into your you know, bag of tricks of things you know and learn how to and can do. And I think you know you're right. There's so many things going right on right now. There's a you know new White House initiative, computer science for all. There's a mm -hmm. New York City Public Schools initiative, computer science for all. There's that word all there. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really interesting to think about how do we make. Um, what now is sort of part of our culture and everyday life, software, and how does software work accessible for everyone? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, and we knew people were doing it. We knew people yeah. were out there coding, and what we did next was we set to task to interview people right. that were uh, blind and use screen readers. And do you want to talk about screen readers? Because I think I've said that word a couple times now, and sure. probably most so, people don't know what they are. So. Um, FYI, I guess it hasn't been said. So I'm blind, right? Um, and I don't use a computer screen. So I've got to have a way to access everything that's happening on a computer screen in some other non-visual way. And so what a screen reader does is it renders that on-screen output into something that's more usable for a blind person, which is usually text-to-speech output and sometimes... Um, also, or instead, refreshable Braille output. If I hold up the Braille display, is that mm -hmm. happening? Thing? Okay. Yeah. So, the thing about a screen reader that separates it from just a straight text-to-speech rendering the way that you may have heard it is that screen readers are super selective. So, it would be really arduous for me to listen to every screen top to bottom. I would never get anything done. And so the screen reader allows me to jump selectively using different UI elements to the information that I want. Mm -hmm. So for example, I can move by paragraph, I can move by heading, I can get something spelled out when that's necessary, and it allows me to kind of judiciously ignore the majority of the information that's on that screen that I don't need at any given time. So um, where the magic really happens is a combination of non-visual output and smart keyboard or braille display commands that are conducive to just jumping to the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. And so what's happening now with, uh, so how are you um, incorporating accessibility into current projects that are happening like the P5JS web editor or other things that are out yeah. there these days? Uh, so I've found, since our first time working together, I found a number of resources that are a little bit more user friendly mm -hmm. and maybe I can provide the link to the mm -hmm. viewers. Uh, Teach Access is a, a one that I'm really a big fan of right now. It's actually an initiative between industry and academia to try to like promote uh, accessible code writing literacy. Uh, so I think industry is in a place now where like these big companies like Facebook and Google and Yahoo, they all are really lacking in the area of accessibility and there's like their people are getting sued all the time now because their sites and their tools are not accessible so they're looking for graduates from academia from computer science and design to come out with skills in accessibility and so it's really an initiative to like have education in the schools and job postings for people that are interested in accessibility and they have really great like in-depth tutorials for learning how to code accessibly so it's at teachaccess.org and I've learned like quite a bit just over working with uh, another processing fellow Atul Varma who mm -hmm. take, has taken a really big interest in the project and has been working with us pretty, pretty closely. Uh, just some tips and tricks along the way for coding accessibly it's daunting how much information there is out there, but it's just about incorporating it into your practice and slowly like picking up things as you go, as with like all coding. 
Um, but yeah, we've been spending the last, Chansey and I, how long has it been? Like four or five months on the project? Uh, quite a while on the project, uh, working to make uh, specifically P5's web editor accessible mm -hmm. to people that use screen readers. Um, and so after the interviews that we did with people that are blind in code, uh, we call them our expert stakeholder interviews. Mm -hmm. uh, we started doing like fun workshops with like eight to ten people at a time, uh, learning how to code in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Uh, all of the participants were screen reader users and blind, and um, we learned from each other like how people that use screen readers could learn how to code, or you know what the sort of workflow would be like, uh, what kind of um, web editor or what kind of like IDE is helpful because mm -hmm. a lot of them are so visually right. oriented. Um, so we, it was like a big learning process, focus group workshop stuff that's happened over the last like few months. And now I think at the end of October we're ready to release like um, the first go at an accessible wow. uh, web editor whose output is right now it's like text based but we're adding some tonal stuff. So. Um, Conceptually, we've we've come across some naysayers for the project because P five is like a very visually oriented right. language. So it's been well, a really yeah. Can I talk about that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So this is one of one of the things that seems to be cropping up again and again right now because we're at such a moment again of um, increasingly available mm -hmm. what you would call visual technologies. They're everywhere. So um, everything from maps on mobile to um, drag and drop interfaces yeah. and I was told so much in school you know you're gonna be excused from this assignment because it's very visual it's actually not most of this information and most of these interactions that we think of that way are not inherently visual any more than the text that's now on my braille display or coming out of my text-to-speech for my screen reader is inherently visual what they are is spatial and what we need are adequate equitable spatial representations. Um, there are blind people who you would think of as visual learners. I think of them as spatial learners. And just as surely as there are folks in the sighted community who prefer a more spatial language as opposed to a textual one, there are blind folks that would prefer to work that way. Coming back to my example of the floor, pl floor plan for the fair, it makes sense for me to do that task in a spatial way. Mm -hmm. and those tools need to be designed with accessibility in mind just as much as textual tools. There is nothing about blindness that makes us prefer linearity or text. It's just that that's what we have now. Um, and what Claire and the Processing Foundation have taken on is a really exciting challenge. And the work is really groundbreaking because it doesn't assume um, that spatial elements should be just left out or designed around. Um, it really, mm -hmm. they're embracing the challenge and, and making um, spatial interactions possible for us, which is fantastic. And I think that you can, you know, the same way that you might think of painting or sculpture as this sort of like physical process mm -hmm. of, you know, working with your hands to mold something or with your hands to spread paint and creating visual art. It's really spatial and physical and, and there's motion and activity with your body. And I think programming the output and thinking through an algorithm that generates something spatial in a lot of ways while you're doing the programming it's a thing that's happening in your mind mm. um, and I, I think you're right that it's really exciting to think about how to represent that how to think through that and how to have that output um, in, in different and novel ways to, so that it's accessible to everyone yeah and what we're doing now is we're working on creating a set of like user preferences so it's not just like one stock way of getting the output like a right. text description but we're working on having like a number of different options for right. people to consume that spatial information. So if somebody wanted to try a screen reader and get a sense of that experience what, um, what would they do? Well, if you have an Apple device, it's very easy. If it's an iOS device, you can just tell Siri to turn on voiceover and later turn off voiceover. If you have a Mac, it's going to be Command F5, which is a toggle. 
and if you are a Windows user, you're going to want to head over to nvaccess.org and download the fabulous free and open source non-visual desktop access. A couple of things to note, you're probably going to want to pull up some quick references before you start your screen reader journey because if you're running a screen reader on a Mac or PC, you're going to want to know some vital keyboard commands for moving around because for most screen reader users it is a mouse free life. And if you're using an iOS device, you're going to want to understand that the gestures totally change when the screen reader is on. So if you were to tap the screen with voiceover on, it will simply speak the element that you're tapping, for example. And a double tap for us is what you're used to as a single tap, and the list goes on. But the good news is that there's a ton of documentation out there, and there's also a fabulously supportive community. On the Apple side, um, go to applevis, applevis.com, for a really lively, well-informed, and good-natured community of support for both users and developers around Apple accessibility. And on the Windows side, uh, of course, nvaccess.org has quite a, a, a wonderful community of its own. Um, that open source screen reader was developed by and for blind people and has a ton of community support available. That's great. It's, really, it's interesting to think about what might be some aspects of programming, the process of programming that the screen reader works sort of perfectly for, whether it's it reads out, you know, there's a bug on this line of code and it tells you what the bug is mm -hmm. versus other things that maybe don't kind of work with that model and whether there's other kind of haptic or audio feedback that could work. And I, I wonder, is this something that you guys are wrestling with and thinking about, like, does the screen reader translate right to the editor? Yeah. Um, so a lot of the common, like, UI elements translate pretty well, like buttons, as long as they're labeled correctly. Mm -hmm. um, but something, again, IDEs have, like, a lot of, like, visual syntax highlighting and stuff like that is not, that's something right. that we're working on right. now about, like, right. a, like, maybe assigning tones to different parts of the code right. syntax. And also, like, visual linting. So, like, as you type, there are error messages that right. you can see. There's, like, parts of the code that's highlighted. Uh, so we've actually incorporated, a, like, a lint warning tone, like a little mm. bell that'll ding if you leave like a brace off a code off a, uh -huh. a line of code for more than like five seconds, it'll it'll ding at right. you. Um, but yeah, one thing that was really interesting from this whole experience is that like in the code learning workshops, like I feel like screen reader users are are primed for learning how to code because of their familiarity with like different like HTML elements right. and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And it was just like kind of a dream to, to do these workshops. Everybody picked it up really quickly. Yeah. And that's because when we visit a website, we really have to know what heading structure is mm -hmm. and what different types of form fields are, et cetera, mm -hmm. just to be able to move around and get some airline tickets or, or place a lunch order. And so I guess our baseline of kind of knowing about and living with HTML may be a little bit higher than, than average. Definitely, I would say. So one thing I'm curious about with the workshops that you've been doing, a lot of the teaching that I do emphasize is learning through your own project ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wonder if any of the people who have attended your uh, workshops have kind of come up with interesting ideas around code or accessibility uh, through learning some of the skills. Yeah, especially um, to do with the output that we're working on crafting and, and forming. Uh, there was a really great suggestion by uh, one of the workshop attendees, Gus Chalkis, uh, to spatialize the information by like creating like this is the p5 output right um, by creating like a something that was akin to like an Excel spreadsheet because you can it's spatialized in that you can arrow through and columns and rows uh, so essentially kind of like a battleship <laughs> to borrow from Chansey uh, like a way to spatialize the right. canvas in a different way can you tell me a little bit about the Ability Project and what that is and how that plays a role in the work and research you guys are doing? Uh, yeah, so the Ability Project's based out at NYU's uh, Tannen School of Engineering, uh, but it's really like an interdisciplinary research project between occupational therapy, uh, NYU's uh, ITP program, Interactive Telecommunications program, and uh, engineering. And basically, we're just trying to further study of uh, the development of assistive and rehab technologies as well as accessibility solutions. Um, and we take 
we take a lot of pride in our approach, which is a very human-centered, uh, community-based approach to developing technologies. So, uh, Chansey, can you, can you say a little bit about why coding is so important to the blind and visually impaired community? I think that sometimes the industry thinks of us, and sometimes we even think of ourselves as kind of the per perpetual consumers. We have struggled so long to get basic access to literacy and other information, and that's kind of our baseline now. But the next step is harnessing our ability to create our own solutions and our own tools. Some of the products that I use that are the most life-changing for me have been created by blind developers. For example, I use an app called Seeing Eye GPS to get around, and that was invented by a blind guy, Mike May. And we need to grow the base of individuals who are willing to engage with their everyday challenges from a problem-solving mindset and then share those solutions. I think ultimately the most compelling technologies and tools we'll ever have will come from within the community. If you think about it, we have Braille because of Lewis Braille. We don't mm -hmm. have it because of outside and development. And, and we need a proper grounding in the fundamentals of coding in particular and STEM education in general so that we can develop the next generation of tools that will liberate us and help us meet whatever goals and whatever challenges we want. So if, um, if people are interested in learning more or getting involved or contributing to your research, is like how can they, what, what are the kinds of things that are stumbling blocks or things that you need help with or ways that people could get involved? Yeah, well, we're hoping to get some help with making some examples mm -hmm. with accessibility in mind. We're hoping to get some examples that have been created entirely using keyboard commands and with screen readers. Um, we're going to put up the documentation for how to use uh, the, um, the web editor with a screen reader, and there there will probably be a link for people in the open source community who want to contribute. Great. Yeah. Another way that I hope that people can take part or contribute, you know, we're such a low incidence disability group. Um, and again, thinking about my education, I just remember, I just remember being excused from so much, and I was a pretty academic kid and a pretty pretty willing to, to try things, but the educators in my life weren't sure how to adapt STEM activities. So I think one of the most important ways that folks can help us out is if you found out about this project, if you try the tool, and you know someone in the community who is either an educator, a person with a print reading disability, or a visual impairment, and they may be wondering whether programming is possible for them or whether any, any kind of um, spatial computing is, is possible for them, connect them to this community of practice because there are tons of us out there that just assume that we won't be doing this. Mm -hmm. And the moment that we get connected into the community, we can first start learning and then after we gain confidence, we can start contributing and the knowledge base grows, and we need help connecting to each other to make that knowledge base grow in mm -hmm. the way that we know it can. Cool. Yeah. Wonderful. What she said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, I hope that um, you know people who will be watching and maybe know someone who's interested in coding um, and wants to get involved and, and learn and contribute, that, that they can get in touch. And you can always get in touch with me, and I'll help you get in touch with Claire or Chansey or through the right channels to help contribute and participate. So thank you guys so much. I, it's really exciting to me to um, have this venue of doing all these programming tutorials. And you know, honestly, what I'm doing is so visual through video, programming with visual, the output is visual, generative, and so I think it's really important for, uh, for me and for everyone to sort of keep in mind mm -hmm. all the different uh, people who might want to learn, might want to watch, and might want to participate and make sure that things are accessible. So uh, I hope that I can help, and <laughs> thanks so much for being the guinea pigs to try being a guest. <laughs> I haven't done that before, and thanks everyone for watching, and come back and have another video sometime, okay? Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.